You are listening to Wrestling Observer Live with Brian Alvarez and Mike Sempervivi on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. You know, that was a total lie. I'm not Mike or Brian Alvarez. Wouldn't, be, wouldn't mind it, you know? Two very successful guys. Uh, Andrew Zarian here, Wrestling Observer Live. I'm joined by Brandon Thurston here. Brandon, are you here? I'm here. Ah, look at Thanks. you. Thanks. You know, I got to tell thanks you. Thanks so much uh, for having me. Of course. Listen, I, I want to, before we get into all the nitty gritty, I, I actually, I want to thank you for the service you do for the entire wrestling community. You put these numbers out. You're, you're on top of this. This morning, I think you had like a three hour broadcast going over the earnings call. Uh, I was glued to it. I, I really, because I find these things fascinating. My co host on Mat Men, not so much into the numbers. So for me to be able to sit here and talk to you about all the numbers stuff, I find, you know, it, it's, it's my own. This is like, a pleasure for me. So I really appreciate you coming on to go over this stuff because a lot of this is very fascinating stuff. Yeah, especially since AEW's come along, uh, there's more interest in ratings than ever. Um, it's become sort of to some wrestling fans, it's become sort of a, a utility. You need your uh, you need wrestling, television, water, electricity, and TV ratings. Um, but yeah, but by the way, th thanks again for having me. Um, just watching you you work the real radio in the last few minutes has been a, watching a sport of its own. It, it really is, man. Was hard. You got You got to see. Like, I got, I'm 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 spinning plates. Nobody could see. They're listening on the radio, but I got like ten spinning plates right now. So let's go into this a little bit. Um, you know, it was a record one point zero nine five billion dollars reported. Yes. I mean, this is this is astronomical numbers for this company. Fourth quarter revenue increased by thirty percent to three hundred and ten million 310.3 million operating income revenue increase 131 percent to 83.6 billion i mean we could go into this but what what was some of the nitty-gritty from this earnings call that you picked up on well the big headline is that this is the most profitable year that w has ever had the most profit i i I'd measure that by net income. That's sort of the most final measure of profit they made 180 million dollars in revenue they hit a billion for the first time ever and even if you adjust for inflation, that is more than they made in their most popular eras. If you go back to the attitude era, and if you adjust that to today's twenty twenty one dollars, uh, that I know it's twenty twenty two, but I adjusted it for twenty twenty one. But if you go back to the attitude era, their their most profitable years ever were ninety nine and two thousand, and that would have been about ninety one to ninety three million dollars in net income. And again, one hundred and eighty. So they basically doubled what the attitude era was and they broke their, their record, which was set last year during the pandemic, the, you know, the, the year of, of 2020, that was, you know, they had no, no ticketed live events, uh, beginning in the middle of March through the rest of the year. Uh, but this year was, uh, very profitable and they made over a billion dollars, largely driven by their increasing TV rights fees that just increase every year. That's that's how the contracts are written. That's how the U.S. one is written, and that's probably how some of the international agreements are written as well. Not really dependent on what the, I mean, not at all dependent on what the TV viewership is. They're guaranteed escalating TV rights fees that are guaranteeing WWE to make more and more money over time because live sports are extremely valuable in this environment. Right, and it's rare to come across, right? Because everybody's locked up into long-term deals. You know, everybody gets locked into a four-year deal, three-year deal, 10-year deal, whatever, whatever, you know, depending on the, the the sporting brand. But, you know, some of the, some of these things is very interesting. First of all, we are no longer in a gate business, uh, even though I believe uh, merch sales uh, had an increase for the first time in a very long time. Uh, I, I read, I forgot where I saw this, but apparently for the longest time, I think it was like an average spend of $10 per, you know, per person that was that was attending an event. And I think it went up by 50 cents. So they're actually, even though their gate is lower because it's less people going to the events, they're spending more money. And some of that is maybe equated to the fact that they have way more merchandise available nowadays or the fact that people, you know, diehards and, and they're spending way more money at these events. Do you, where do you think that falls in line? Well, Venny Merch Per Capita was $12 in this quarter. $12, it was, it okay. was up to 14 yeah, it was, it was $14 in, in Q3. That's that's the July, August, September quarter where they were had just returned to touring. And there was a lot of pent-up demand and a lot of enthusiasm for their events. And $14 per head down to 12 And I think that's more reflective of what, what the regular price is going to be going forward. The last, uh, let's look at Q4 2019, it was $9 per head. So some of that's inflation, I suppose. 
but uh, yeah, just more people spending more money. And the, the average attendance is, is a bit down in Q4 versus the Q4 of 2014. Uh, they average, I believe, 5,200 uh, in paid attendance in North America versus I believe it's 5,400 or 5,800. So if average attendance was a little bit down per event. And maybe you've just got more hardcore fans left that's pushing that average up and maybe a little bit of inflation. Just maybe some prices are going up on merchandise. But but yeah, they're they're... Then merch per capita is up. So looking at the conference call, you know, where do you see the growth uh, for WWE when it comes to 2022? Do you, I mean, obviously the rights fees are going to go up for the next next set of, of, of contracts that they're going to sign uh, for television because that's just how the nature of television is headed right now where everybody's getting more and more probably. money. But probably, so. probably. Uh, where do you see as far as the business goes when you look at this the trajectory for 2022? What stood out to you? Was there anything that, that stood out with this conference call where you could say, okay, you know what? They're going to, this is where they're going to maybe change some stuff. Nick Khan hyped that this, the president and chief revenue officer W. Nick Khan hyped that they have over a dozen pieces of scripted and unscripted content that they're going to announce. It sounds like media content. I don't know if it's documentaries or, or what they've got in store. So that's one area of growth where they have all of these, not just, you know, obviously they're monetizing their weekly wrestling programs and their premium live events monthly uh, through NBC Universal and through Fox and through international distributors, but they're also selling other kinds of programming to other, whether it's streaming platforms or networks, we saw the A&E deal that that happened in 2021. So there's incremental growth happening there. And there's other ways that they're growing uh, revenue incrementally too. They're supposed to roll out an NFT marketplace soon with Fox, and I think it's Bento Box. Uh, there's there's gonna be a, a 2K game coming out that should drive some revenue if it's a good game. Uh, but yeah, they, ha they have, opportunities in gaming they have uh small deals like they they're, they're introducing lottery tickets scratch off lottery tickets uh, but there's a lot of these little deals that nick khan is well suited to make and his team of people are well suited to help WWE make in addition to nick khan and, and his people being especially well suited to negotiate favorable tv rights deals for them going forward and i should add to you the the network the network is obviously in the U.S. on Peacock, but they have other deals to make internationally. Uh, the biggest one that just happened is the Disney Hotstar deal in Indonesia. Very which interesting. Is maybe yeah, which is maybe worth a decent amount of money. Maybe not. It's not clear. You know, they don't disclose everything that we could possibly want to know. But that's that's another big area for growth. Is how what kind of deals can they make internationally to distribute the W Network content? You know, and that, and I think that's the advantage that they have over AEW right now is the fact that they have this this embedded product that people recognize, and they could get really you know decent international deals here. You know, that's really where this kind of falls into place for WWE over AEW because AEW, listen, they're a couple of years old. Uh, the product is not as recognizable as something that's been around for fifty plus years, or or even modern wrestling, last twenty some odd years where we got this boom period. So very interesting stuff. I, I'm I'm really fascinated to see what this does because when you really talk about WWE programming on television, the ratings are not going up, but the rights fees are. And generally, you know, you don't necessarily see that too often. But like you said, we're we're in a very different world where sports content is highly in demand. Mm -hmm. They would argue that their linear, their traditional TV viewership may be down, but their engagement and digital viewership in other ways is up. Um, I think it's it's a complicated story, but even if television viewership for them is down, they're still among the most popular programs on TV. Uh, when you look at the rankings that places like Showbiz Daily publish of the, the daily top cable originals, uh, now that football is out of the way for the last two weeks, the top three slots are those three hours of Raw on cable among the original programs. So raw and smackdown on friday are among the most popular programs with viewers 18 to 49 and that's really valued even if when we look at year-over-year -year comparisons uh viewership is down even if raw just recorded some of its lowest demo viewership numbers ever hey we're gonna come back right after this but i want to talk about viewership in north america and what that means for professional wrestling wrestling observer live angels aaron here we'll be right back after this
Wrestling Observer Live. Andrew Zarian here. Talking to Brandon Thurston. Talking about the earnings call, ratings, and everything else that, that, that we heard during that call. Uh, weekly ratings, which I want to go into. SmackDown overnights, 2.06 million down due to the Olympics. Raw, 1.8 six five up from one seven six six nxt and dynamite nxt did 593 i believe and dynamite did 954 brandon you know there's a lot of talk over the numbers right people people it becomes a big argument online about about what the numbers mean and why they were down and south park debuted and football was on and nxt's you know who knows what was going on tuesday you know, when you look at these numbers, and, and you and I have had numerous conversations about this, you know, what overnights are, what, you know, what, what the actual numbers fast are. Fast nationals. Fast nationals. I'm sorry. Fast nationals. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, these live numbers really don't mean anything to the viewer. They mean something to an advertiser on what you could get for the viewership at that hour competitively against other products on TV. But when we look at as far as popularity goes, how should we measure this? When we talk about television ratings, well, I, I think, I think the if we're talking about the difference between W and AEW, I mean AEW's viewership is younger. About half of their viewership is in the demo of eighteen to forty-nine. That's that's the demographic that determines the ad rates. Most of the ad rates. Some ads you can kind of, kind of tell if it's prescription drugs. It's probably a P fifty plus ad. But a lot of the ads, and especially the more valuable ads, are eighteen to forty-nine. Um, and in 1849, Raw and Dynamite are getting pretty close. I think there's there's three occasions now where Dynamite and Live same day just barely edged out Raw. Um, but you know, W is still a far more recognizable brand. They have a much larger total viewership, uh, mostly driven by people over the age of 50. But W is still this far more recognizable brand, which you know shows itself in a, in a lot of different ways, uh, especially maybe in in this older. TV audience that they have that watches it more readily than they watch uh, WWE, maybe just because it's, it's this older brand that has existed and dominated the scene since 2001. Um, I know you're asking about DVR viewership and how much does that change the picture? Uh, I got my hands on some DVR viewership uh, towards the end of last year, and we can see sort of what, what are the percentage lifts that that DVR viewership for the for the following seven days gives. And for Raw, it's it's in terms of total viewership, it gives it something like a thirteen percent lift. For SmackDown, it's like an eleven percent lift. Uh, for Dynamite, so this is let's say October, a twenty two percent lift for Dynamite, a thirty two percent lift for Rampage. I guess because Rampage is later, maybe more people miss it. Uh, there's there's a larger percentage of DVR viewership happening there. And uh, in the case of, of NXT, it's about 12%. So I, I, don't, I don't know what, what that says about the viewership. We could only speculate that maybe people are going out of their way if they miss a program to watch AEW more so than they are the WWE programs. I think in Rampage, it's just a case of in that 10 o'clock time slot, people miss it quite a bit. And some people make an effort to catch up with it. So another thing is, you know, a lot of this is Nielsen numbers as well, right? That plays right. a big part in this. So I know YouTube TV participates in Nielsen, uh, Nielsen, I guess, statistics and analytics. Uh, so does Hulu Live. But what happens to yeah. the on-demand content on Hulu? Is that incorporated in this at all? And even even for AEW, anything that's on demand, is that incorporated at all in these in these numbers when we discuss them? No. If if you're watching Raw on the USA Network or Fox on or SmackDown on Fox or AW on TNT or CBS, whatever way you're watching, whether it's through traditional cable or satellite, or whether it's through the virtual MVPD, which is YouTube TV, Hulu Live, Sling, uh, you are being counted. I don't know if you're being counted or not, but you, you could be in the sample that Nielsen collects and then extrapolates onto the whole population to, to give these numbers that we see. Um, but next day viewership on Hulu is, is not a part of that. Uh, watching clips, on YouTube are, are not a part of that. Um, and and I've, I've been doing some uh, scraping of, of the YouTube viewership lately. Uh, I just tweeted a, a table today, you know, looking at let's let's take the last seven days of the new content on YouTube for both WB and AEW. And look at, you know, how many views are the clips of the shows getting and the top slots are usually dominated by by WWE. Uh, but sometimes in the top five, there's an AEW clip in there. 
Um, so the new content is between W and AEW is sometimes close. Um, there's, there's definitely quite a few AEW clips within, let's say the top 20. Um, but when we look at what WWE's YouTube channel overall does in a given week or any period of time, it's massively way ahead of AEW, which is the next nearest, uh, channel. I don't think impact is, is, is up there as much, even though they probably have more subscribers on their, on their channel, but the, the vast library of content that WWE has on its YouTube channel alone, I think it's something like 59,000 uploads that they have because they've been on YouTube since, since day one, practically, uh, there's this, this massive archive of library content that's on their YouTube channel that accounts for, uh, at least in the last week. And I think it's, this is typical, uh, of, of what's happening normally 70% of the views that they get in a, in a given period of time are of content that's at least a week, more than a week old. So it could be years old. Um, so there's, there's that advantage they have, at least in terms of collecting YouTube views, which, um, probably means something like 20 to $30 million a, a year. Maybe, maybe that's even grown, you know, YouTube just put out a report uh, on its ad revenue uh, and it's, it's generating in, in Q4, it generated more ad revenue than Netflix generated in subscriber revenue, which was pretty fascinating to me. Very interesting stuff. You know, also saturating the content. You said 59,000 clips they have on there. AEW, you know, and they also probably, and, and this is me to knowing how WWE's structure works on that side of, of content. They are very in tune with how to present that content and when they upload. Like, they don't upload just random stuff, right? Like they, I'll give an example. Uh, just yesterday, they uploaded a Oscar versus Bailey video, right? That that's there's there's supposed to be some synergy there with the TV product. They're supposed to remind you that these two exist and they're coming soon. You know everything that they do kind of is is intuitive with that. But you know also fourteen year, twelve year, whatever the terms are for YouTube, they have an advantage. They've been there for a while. They have a partnership agreement with them. They have uh, meetings with them. AEW is just getting started with this. You know not, it doesn't say much as far as AEW not doing well, but. What is this? Where Where is the viewership coming from? Because for the longest time, the the stigma was, well, those viewers are international viewers. They're not North American viewers, the, the most of them. But I don't know if that's true anymore. I, I've been told by some, some people who are Indian wrestling fans that the YouTube clips are geoblocked in India for the first 24 hours. Um, it's the, the latest that, that W has ever said publicly about this is that 30% of the YouTube viewership or the digital engagement that, that they get is from the U S so 70% of it is international. Um, and if you look at their, even this, this includes their, their latest report, I think 80% of their revenue was North America, their entire picture of revenue, 80% of it was North America and only 20% of it, uh, was international. So that gives you sort of a, a, a dichotomy of they've, they're a very international product, at least when you look at them digitally, but where they're getting their money from is, is from North America, uh, which largely because of the economy, the economies that are the difference in the economies between the U S and just about everybody else, where, you know, a lot of the ads that they sell, the, the, the more uh, lucrative ads that they sell are from the U S you know, when you, when you look at the integrations, which was a big talking point on, on this, uh, earnings call, the integrations that they have with, whether it's, um, Red Notice, the Netflix show, Jackass with John, having Johnny Knoxville. I just heard in, in the news update that Jackass was the number one uh, movie this week. Um, so th there's a lot of that. And uh, they're putting all that stuff on their premium live events, now they're called. And uh, an another big talking point from the earnings call is how much viewership on Peacock has increased versus the U.S. viewership on the WWE Network when those events were just on the direct to consumer W network, but no, no exact numbers though. We, we don't get exact no. viewership numbers. Yeah. That that's the big mm. secret number. That's the secret sauce. They don't, they don't tell you that. That's right. I'm sure they tell their advertisers, but there was about, I think it was like 20 to 30% depending on the, the, the paper, uh, the PLE, uh, mm -hmm. but except for one. And that was crown jewel that saw a 70% yeah. increase in viewership over 2019 numbers i think the 2019 one was t took place on halloween so maybe that makes a little bit sense that it was such a big increase compared to the other pay-per-views but what where, what did you make of that uh when the w network as a direct consumer service in the united states shut down they had 1.1 million subscribers 
the peak was in 2018 when they had 1.3 million in the WrestleMania quarter. So when you're on Peacock, Peacock just reported in the com well, Comcast reported in their earnings call a week or two ago that there's 9 million paid subscribers independent of the people who get Peacock because of their Comcast cable subscribers or their Cox communication subscribers. They said that there's 7 million highly engaged subscribers through that avenue. So that would come up to what 16 million subscribers who are using Peacock. So that's a lot more than 1.1 million in the Wait US. So, so viewership is, is consequently up uh, for these premium live events. So uh, fascinating. As you said, uh, 20, 25%, uh, money in the bank was up. SummerSlam was up 30%. Extreme rules was up 20%. The Saudi event in October up 75%, uh, survivor series, almost 25% and Royal rumble this year versus the Royal rumble of 2020, which is the last time they had fans in attendance was up 45%. So a lot more viewership for that. Very interesting stuff. Uh, very different company. Uh, you know, a lot of Vince really did not play a part in this earnings call. I think he just did an intro. Uh, he seldom yeah. does. Yeah, that that's it. Uh, it's a Nick Khan mm -hmm. show. Uh, that's right. Brandon, man, thank you for coming on. This this was fantastic. Uh, love to have you on again. Thank you for having me. Wrestling awesome. Observer Live will be back right after this. A lot to talk about, especially WWE and AEW TV right after this.